Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan. I'm a solutions architect with Stratusgrid. Stratusgrid is a consulting company. We're a premier partner with AWS, and we also are a software as a service provider. We have a software tool called Stratosphere that you can find on our website at stratusgrid.com. Stratosphere is essentially a FinOps tool that helps you to evaluate your costs in AWS, as well as find cost optimization opportunities using data from services like AWS Trusted Advisor, EC2 Compute Optimizer, and a variety of other services. And we provide a centralized view of that data across your entire AWS organization. Or if you actually have multiple AWS organizations, we actually allow you to consolidate all of that data into a centralized view. And this is particularly helpful for large enterprises that are dealing with lots of child companies as well as private equity firms that need visibility into their portfolio companies spend and cost optimization opportunities as well so the topic for today's video is going to be a service known as aws storage gateway now aws storage gateway is partially managed service and it's partially an on-premises kind of self-hosted service so essentially what Storage Gateway is, is it's a pre-configured virtual machine or hardware appliance that you can deploy into your AWS VPC, Virtual Private Cloud Network Environment. And you can also deploy it into an on-premises or co-located data center environment where you actually are running hypervisors yourself. Or if you want to install the managed hardware appliance that AWS provides, you can deploy that into your own data center as well. Now, what Storage Gateway does for you is it allows you to configure other applications to utilize that Storage Gateway as an NFS, Network File System Share, or SMB, Server Message Block Share. Now, if you're familiar with the Windows platform, Windows typically uses SMB as a network storage protocol. So if you're connecting Windows clients to a storage server, like a Windows server system and some application that's running on that Windows server, if you need to connect that to Storage Gateway, typically you're going to be using the SMB protocol. Whereas with Linux servers that you're running on your network and applications that are running, on those Linux servers will typically be accessing data on a network file share using NFS instead. So it really depends on what protocol you want to use, but both of those protocols are supported. There's actually multiple other types of gateways though. So the file gateway is the one that we're gonna be focusing on in particular, and that's the one that supports NFS and SMB, but there's actually a virtual tape gateway as well that allows you to store data on kind of a virtual tape library, so to speak. And then there's also a volume gateway, another type of gateway that allows you to store data on an iSCSI based disk across the network. And that can actually store data in Amazon S3 or on local volumes on that server as well. So there's a few different types of gateways available depending on your specific use case. But for this video, we're gonna be focusing on the file gateway that allows you to serve up NFS and SMB shares across the network. Now, before we jump in and actually take a look at File Gateway, I wanted to encourage you to like this video if you learned something new. Also, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so that you get notified about any new videos that we come out with. And also leave a comment and let me know what you thought of this video and any other topics that you're interested in seeing on our video channel. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the topic. So I'm in the AWS Management Console here. This is the AWS Storage Gateway Service. If you just search for something like storage or if you search for gateway or something like that, typically Storage Gateway will come up pretty quickly. Now I'd also encourage you to check out the documentation for Storage Gateway. If I go to the Storage Gateway documentation site here, they actually have separate user guides kind of separate sections in the documentation website for AWS that focus on different types of gateways. So remember, I mentioned that there's a file gateway. That's the one we're going to be focusing on in this video. There's also the tape gateway here that allows you to store data on a virtual tape in S3 Glacier. And then there's the volume gateway. And there's actually another type of file gateway called the FSX gateway, which is specifically for Windows file server shares. But we're going to be focusing on this file gateway here that allows us to create NFS and the SMB shares as well. 
So like I mentioned, there's a few different deployment mechanisms for this gateway that we're deploying. It's actually a virtual machine that you run. You can run it in hypervisors like Amazon EC2. You can run it on ESXi uh, VMware. You can run it on Microsoft Hyper-V. You can run it as a Linux KVM virtual machine. Or again, you can run it on EC2. So Amazon provides an AMI or Amazon machine image that is pre-configured for the storage gateway. So it has storage gateway pre-installed and it has everything that you need. All you have to do is deploy an EC2 instance that has that AMI. That'll set up the storage gateway for you. It'll connect to the various APIs that it needs to on the back end. And then you can actually go out and create what are called file shares on top of that gateway. So the gateway itself just gets deployed into an existing virtual private cloud network environment. You deploy it into a particular subnet and it sets up all of the things like the security group for you so that all the necessary inbound ports are set up. You can actually do some additional customization if you'd like to, but the default configuration is just kind of a standard M5X large virtual machine. It sets up all the necessary security group rules for you so that all those ports are exposed to your clients that need to access that network storage in the VPC. And so it's really easy to set up. Now, the nice thing about the file gateway is that it uses S3 as the backing storage mechanism. So you can just create an S3 bucket in the same region where that file gateway exists. And that file gateway is just going to read and write data to and from that S3 bucket. So some applications, maybe applications that you're developing internally, might use the S3 APIs directly to store and retrieve data in S3. However, you can also use other applications that maybe you don't have control over. Uh, maybe they're off-the-shelf vendor applications that need access to local storage. And so for those types of applications where you don't really have control over the storage mechanism, you can implement the file gateway, you can mount the NFS or SMB share locally as a local volume, and then those applications will just be completely kind of transparent as far as figuring out how the storage works, right? Because it looks like a local volume. So as long as the application sees it as a local volume, it doesn't really care if it's SMB or NFS or iSCSI or really anything else, right? Because we're just mounting that as a local volume. So that's kind of how file gateway works. You just create an S3 bucket, you create the, the gateway itself, which is again, that virtual machine. And then you can start creating what are called these file shares that use a particular protocol. And then you can mount that from various clients. We're actually going to step through and set up a file gateway. I'm not going to talk through all the intricacies of setting up a VPC from scratch. I'll assume that you're kind of familiar with those concepts already. So feel free to search for other content out there that talks about setting up VPCs. I'm just going to be using the default VPC that we have already set up in our AWS environment in our account. And we're just going to deploy into that existing VPC. So if we just take a look at the VPC over here, I'm just going to show you what that looks like really quick. So if we go to your VPCs, I do have a default VPC here. That's this one right here that doesn't have any name associated with it. So you can see default VPC is yes right here. And then the subnets that are associated with that VPC, let me just sort by the ID right here, you can see that I have two different subnets right here, and those are in two different availability zones. So I have US West 1A and US West 1C, which map to AZ1 and AZ number three accordingly. And so this VPC is already set up so that I can go ahead and just deploy uh, EC2 instances or storage gateways or other types of resources into that VPC. All right, so what we're gonna do is head back to the storage gateway console right here. I think I actually have that open in a separate tab right here. And the first thing we're going to do is go to gateways right here, and we're just going to create a gateway. Now, at this stage, you don't need to have an S3 bucket yet. You need the S3 bucket when you actually create the file share itself. For now, all we're going to do is actually create the EC2 instance that runs the storage gateway itself. And it's going to prompt us for which VPC, which subnet, and which SSH key pair or which public key we want to associate to that virtual machine just in case we ever need to log in remotely to that storage gateway. Now, most of the time, you're not going to have to log into the storage gateway like you do with other you know, Linux servers that you maybe SSH into to install software, update packages, and things like that, because the managed portion of the storage gateway service is that Amazon provides the storage gateway software and the 
Amazon machine image that you actually deploy the storage gateway from. And so all of those updates are managed through the storage gateway service. So again, in general, you won't have to log into the storage gateway, but it's always good to have an SSH key pair associated with the gateway, just in case for some reason you do need to remotely log in to the storage gateway. So we're just gonna hit create gateway here. And the first thing we're gonna do is just give it a name. So I'm just gonna call this Trevor dash video. And then you can choose a time zone for that gateway. So I'm in the mountain time zone. So I'll go ahead and choose that. And then you have the option to choose which type of gateway, right? So we have the file gateway, which supports NFS and SMB. We have the FSX gateway, which is designed for Windows file servers. We have the tape gateway and the volume gateway as well. But in this case, we want NFS or SMB access. So we're just going to choose NFS. And then later on, we'll actually spin up a separate EC2 instance that runs just a Ubuntu server Linux distribution. We'll log into that Linux server, and then we'll actually mount the storage gateway NFS file share using NFS to that Linux server, and that will kind of show how it works from a practical perspective. We're going to choose the file gateway here, and then for the platform options, this allows us to determine where we want to deploy the gateway itself. So if you are running VMware ESX on-premises, or if you're running Hyper-V on-premises, uh, or maybe Linux KVM, you can choose those options. You can also choose the hardware appliance here and actually order a hardware appliance. And if you do a search for storage gateway hardware appliance something like that then you can learn about the hardware appliance itself it's basically just a one u server that aws provides to you here and that has everything kind of pre-set up for the storage gateway service. This is just another option that you have for hosting it in your own data center. But the easiest option, if you're just learning about storage gateway or if you're just running everything in AWS, is to use the Amazon EC2 platform here. So that's just gonna spin up a virtual machine in EC2 and set everything up for us. Now you do have the ability to choose customize your settings. And if you click on launch instance here, this will take you over into the EC2 console here and you can you know, give it a custom name. You can choose a custom instance type down here. You'll see that it automatically chose the latest AMI version for the storage gateway. So it just pre-selects that for you, but pretty much everything else can be completely customized here as far as the instance type goes, the, the size, the number of virtual CPUs, the amount of memory that you have, that kind of thing. There are minimum requirements, so you want to check out the documentation for that. But then you can choose your, your storage configuration. You can choose if you want it to be a spot instance, or uh, you can choose to have an IAM role associated with it or something like that. But for now, we're just going to go ahead and cancel that. And we're going to do use default settings here. And so that's going to simplify the process a lot for us. All we have to do is choose the VPC. So I'm just going to choose my default VPC here. Then I can choose a subnet. So I'll choose the subnet that's in US West 1A. And then I'll just choose an SSH key pair or a public key here that I want to put onto that virtual machine so that I can remotely authenticate to it. All right, so let's just hit next right here. Actually, let's hit launch instance. And this is just going to launch the EC2 instance into our AWS account. And it's actually going to create that in EC2. So we can go to the EC2 console and actually see that virtual machine running in just a moment here. So this will take just a moment to set up, but you can see that as part of this wizard, it creates the security group and then it adds the necessary inbound rules to that security group so that the storage gateway is accessible from other clients. Now let's head over to the documentation while that is launching right here. And we can take a look at the file gateway setup requirements, head down to prerequisites here. This just talks about some of the networking prerequisites here. If we take a look at the hardware requirements for on-premises virtual machines, you can see that the requirements are four virtual processors assigned to the VM. You also want to have 16 gigabytes of memory, minimal, minimum for the file gateway. And you also wanna have 80 gigs for the virtual machine image. And then there's also a cache. So let's do a search for cache right here. So for the cache, it actually needs to be a separate storage volume. So in EC2, this would be known as an elastic block store volume or EBS volume. And so this needs to be a minimum of 150 gigabytes. So the way the storage gateway works is that you read and write data to and from the storage gateway, but the storage gateway provides high performance by caching that data locally on the appliance itself. 
And then what happens is that periodically the local cache actually gets flushed up to the S3 bucket where you tell it to store your data. So the data isn't just immediately written to S3 because that wouldn't necessarily be a scalable solution. What happens is the storage gateway writes it locally to this cache volume. And then periodically that cache is then sent off to the S3 bucket. So sometimes there is a little bit of a delay. If you write a file to the storage gateway from another server on the same VPC, there could be a few seconds delay, maybe like 10, 15, 20 seconds, something like that, before you actually see the file get written into the S3 bucket. So we'll see that when we actually test out this functionality. There's also a lot of good documentation down here that talks about the individual ports that are required in order to utilize the storage gateway. But again, this stuff is all gonna be set up for us, so we don't have to worry about that. Now, after the gateway has been created, you also do have to go through and activate the gateway. So this, there's an activation process, and there's a document here that talks about the activation process here, but the AWS Management Console will just kind of take you through this, and you don't really have to worry about it. Let's go back to the storage gateway console. You can see our EC2 instance was launched successfully. So now if we go to the next page right here, you can see this is going to allow us to configure the gateway. So we, we're just gonna use the publicly routable IPv4 address right here of the machine. And then down here, we're gonna choose if we want to use a publicly accessible endpoint or if we want to have the storage gateway endpoint VPC hosted using AWS private link, using a local endpoint. But in this case, we're just gonna use the publicly accessible APIs because we have not gone into the VPC service and actually created a storage gateway endpoint. But that is an option if you wanna keep all of your network traffic internal to your VPC. So after we set this up, then we're going to be prompted to activate the gateway. So that'll take you to this screen right here where it shows you the details of your gateway, the connection details that we just saw on the previous screen. And then all we need to do is click on activate gateway. So once the gateway has been activated, you'll see we have some additional options right here. So we have cache storage that'll just prompt you with the disk that's been pre-attached to the EC2 instance. Let's open up the EC2 console in another tab right here. And if we go to our running instances right here, you can actually see that we have a storage gateway instance right here. It's currently running. The instance type is M5X large. We can see it's in the US West 1A availability zone that we selected. And there's the publicly routable IPv4 address that we saw in the activation screen. And right down here, you can see that mounted under dev SDB is a 150 gigabyte volume that will be allocated to the cache. Now, Storage Gateway also allows you to integrate with the Amazon CloudWatch service for a couple of purposes. The number one is for logging any activity on the Storage Gateway itself. So we use the CloudWatch Logs group for us, uh, sorry, CloudWatch Logs service for that particular service. And we create a resource called a log group and you can have it either use an existing log group that you've already set up and configured the retention policies on, or you can just have it automatically create a new log group for this particular purpose. Also, CloudWatch provides an alarming service. So based on certain metrics for your storage gateway, you can set up alarms so that when certain thresholds are breached on those alarms, you can get notifications through services like Amazon SNS or Simple Notification Service, so that you can get emails or text messages or other types of notifications, perhaps through a webhook endpoint to notify you when those thresholds are breached. I'm just gonna choose not to create any alarms for the time being though. So we're just gonna be using the CloudWatch Logs service to log any activity on the gateway. So then we'll click on configure down here at the bottom. And now you can see our storage gateway is running and everything is set up so we can start using it. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that right here under storage resources, we currently have zero file shares because after you create the storage gateway itself, which again is this EC2 instance that we have running right here in the EC2 console, the next thing that we need to do is to actually create what's called a file share. So you can either click on a create file share right here, or you can go over to the file shares section in the storage gateway console here. And then what we wanna do is just hit create a new file share. So when you create a new file share, it's gonna prompt you to choose a gateway. So in this case, we just have a single file gateway that we've deployed right here. It'll ask you to choose which file share protocol you want to use. Again, with file gateway, we have NFS or SMB. 
with other types of gateways. There would be things like iSCSI, for example, that you would have as an interface. Um, but we're going to choose NFS for now because that's typically what Linux environments are going to be using. Then for the S3 bucket right here, we can choose to just create a new S3 bucket. And I'll just call this Trevor Stratus Grid dash storage gateway dash USW1 for the region right here. We'll hit create an S3 bucket. And then we'll go ahead and just use that one as our storage location for this file gateway. So NFS will be the interface that we use to connect to the file share from other Linux servers in our VPC. And then ultimately this S3 bucket is where any data that's written to the NFS share is ultimately gonna get stored. Also, if you were to upload any files to this S3 bucket using other external tools like the AWS CLI, AWS PowerShell module, GUI applications, basically any data that you write directly to that S3 bucket is gonna be visible through the NFS file share as well. So just be aware of that. So now what we'll do is go down and just hit create file share. It's a pretty quick process. The gateway itself is kind of the longer process because it actually has to launch a virtual machine. And so now we have a brand new file share here. All right. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that audit logs is not enabled by default. So you can set up logging to CloudWatch logs for the gateway, but you can also set up logging at the file share level. And I didn't customize that when I created the file share. So I'll just go to actions and then say edit file share settings right here. And then we'll go ahead and say use an existing log group. And then I'm going to choose the log group that was set up for our storage gateway. And I need to figure out which of these storage gateways it is. So let's open up the storage gateway console in another window. And so it's EDB91D84. So we're just gonna choose to search here and look for EDB91D84. So we're just gonna use the same log group for logging storage gateway events, as well as any events related to the specific file share that we are creating. All right, so now that we've got that set up, we'll go ahead and just choose to save changes here. One other thing that I did wanna point out though is that you can actually override the default storage class in S3. So by default, it's gonna use S3 standard. And if you go out to Google and just search for S3 pricing details, the S3 standard is gonna be kind of just the standard rate. It's kind of the, I think it's the most expensive. But if we take a look at the pricing here, S3 standard is typically gonna be around 2.3 cents per gigabyte. Now there's a lot of other options available in S3. So there's things like S3 infrequent access. So if you have data that you need to store in S3 that's not very frequently retrieved, then you can use this infrequent access option here. And that's only 1.25 cents per gigabyte. So significantly less than the standard storage. There's also things like Express One Zone, there's Glacier with Instant Retrieval, there's Glacier with Flexible Retriever, Retrieval, there's S3 Glacier Deep Archive, um, and things like that. So there's a lot of different options that you have here, and you do have the option to use certain pricing tiers with Storage Gateway. So we can choose things like S3 Intelligent Tiering, we can choose S3 One Zone IA, so that has less durability, but it's also for infrequent access, so it's only stored in a single availability zone, and it's designed for infrequent access. So S3 Standard would have higher durability than One Zone, because S3 Standard is replicated across multiple availability zones, but it's designed for infrequent access, and then S3 One Zone is less durable, but also designed for S3 uh, infrequent access as well. So it's really up to you what storage tier you want to use here, and it really depends on your specific use case. So if you're running an application that's going to be frequently pulling data off of this NFS share, frequently writing data to the NFS share, then you might want to just stick with the S3 standard service here. But you could also, if you're just going to be storing data there, just writing lots of data, but not reading lots of data, you could choose something like S3 standard infrequent access, or if it's just temporary data that you don't really care about the durability so much on, then you could just use the one zone infrequent access here and just write that data, forget about it. And, you know, eventually that data may age out. So it really depends on your specific use case. But for now, I'll just stick with S3 standard for the storage class here. So let's save those changes. And then I'll also head over to the CloudWatch service here. So if we just do a search for watch and navigate over to the CloudWatch service, 
CloudWatch Logs is just one of the services available in CloudWatch. There's metrics, there's logs, there's alarms. Uh, there used to be a separate service called CloudWatch Events, but that's actually known as EventBridge in AWS now, so that's a separate service. So you can see a list of all those services over here. If we head over to the log groups under the logs service here, we can see a list of the log groups. Then I'll search for storage again. And we're going to look for this log group down here that has our storage gateway ID associated with it in the name. And then what we can do is just click on start tailing right here. And this will show us kind of real time events as they're being emitted by the storage gateway or by the file share that we created. So we can just kind of keep an eye on this and watch for new log events that come in. So now that we've got the storage gateway set up, the file share set up, and we're actively monitoring the logs here, let's go ahead and spin up an EC2 instance as a Linux server that we'll use as the client to mount the remote NFS file share from the storage gateway. So to do that, we're just gonna head over to the EC2 service right here. And we're going to go to instances and choose launch a new instance. I'll just call this Linux NFS client 01. Actually put Trevor before it just so other teammates know that that's me. And then I'll choose an Ubuntu image here because I typically prefer Ubuntu, but really any Linux distribution that supports NFS should be fine. Then for my instance type here, I'll just choose a T3 small. For my key pair, I'll choose an SSH key pair that I use. And then for my VPC settings down here, I'm going to choose the same availability zone. So US West 1A, where my storage gateway is located so that we don't have to send data across availability zones. I'll make sure I have a public IP so I can log in or SSH into that VM across the internet. And then for the security group here, I'll just choose an existing security group that has SSH inbound access. I think this Rust one here has SSH inbound allowed as well. And then for my storage, I'll just use the default here. Eight gigs is plenty for the client here. And then for my IAM instance profile, I'll just choose an IAM instance profile that has some permission set up so that this virtual machine can talk to the systems manager service and register itself with the SSM service. That's just a good practice to make sure that you're able to see all of your EC2 infrastructure in the systems manager service. And then down here, I'm going to choose spot instance, so I don't have to spend full price on my virtual machine here. And then for the spot instance options, I'll choose that it's a one-time instance. So if I terminate this instance, it won't automatically spin up a new one for me. All right, so I think that's everything that I want to configure here. So I'll go ahead and just choose to launch this new EC2 instance. And then once this EC2 instance is up and running, we can SSH into it. And then we'll be able to install the necessary prerequisites and mount the file share. So I'll open up a terminal locally here. And the first thing I want to look for is the publicly routable IPv4 address so I can authenticate to that system. Let's just run SSH Ubuntu at IP address. And after just a few moments here, we should be able to log into that virtual machine. Sometimes it takes a few moments for it to launch the new virtual machine, but in you know 30 or 60 seconds or something like that, that virtual machine should become available. And I just realized I grabbed the wrong IP address. I actually grabbed the IP address for the storage gateway here, not the new Linux instance that I created. So let's just refresh here, find the Linux instance here, and make sure I copy the correct IP for that system here. So we'll do SSH Ubuntu at IP. It, yes, we want to confirm that host key. And now we're logged into our client system. So what I can do is go over to the console, the AWS management console here, and then we'll navigate back over to the storage gateway service and make sure that you go to the file share, not the storage gateway, but the actual file share that we created here. And then on the file share page, if you just scroll down to the bottom, there are example commands down here to mount this particular file share. So what we're going to do is copy this sudo mount command right here. And then this already has the IP address of the storage gateway configured. All we have to do is override the mount path with a directory where we want to mount that NFS share on the Linux system. 
So let's head back over here to our terminal and I'm going to do a make dir, actually sudo make dir on the slash mount slash NFS data directory there. So now if I do ls slash mount, I can see there's a directory here called NFS data. And then now that we've got this mount point, this empty mount point created, all we need to do is paste in this command and then we'll do slash mount slash NFS data. And we are going to get an error here. So even though this is a perfectly valid command, you'll see that we have a error saying that for certain file systems, you might need a mount.type helper program. And so if we take a look at the mount programs that are available, if you just hit tab a couple times, it'll auto complete the binaries that are available on your path environment variable. You can see that we have a bunch of mount options here for things like NTFS or Fuse 3, things of that nature, but we don't have mount.nfs. And so what we actually have to do on Ubuntu Linux, and this may be different for other Linux distributions, but we actually need to do a sudo apt install nfs-common-yes. And the nfs-common package is going to provide the necessary helper utility. So that's a pretty tiny package to install. And if we do mount tab again, you should now see that we have mount.nfs and mount.nfs4 binaries available. So now, we can just hit the up arrow a couple of times and rerun that command and it will work perfectly fine. So now we can just run the mount command here and confirm that we do have that mounted. So let's look for that mount in this list here. Let's do a control F and we'll search for data. And sure enough, right down here at the bottom, you can see this mount point right here is mounted on slash mount slash NFS data. It's of type NFS4, and we can see all of the options related to that mount right down here. So now that we've got that mount confirmed, we can go ahead and read and write some data from that mount point on the local system. So what we're gonna do is say ls slash mount slash NFS data. Let's do ls dash LGA. And you can see that right now there's nothing in there. So what I'm going to do is just say touch test.txt. We'll put some data in there, like testing this file. We'll go ahead and write that file. And then I'm going to move test.txt from my home directory over to that mount point. So we'll say slash mount slash NFS data. And then if we just rerun the ls command right here, now you can see that we have a file 18 bytes in size called the test.txt in that mount point. So now what we can do is actually verify that that file is accessible from the S3 bucket that is backed by the storage gateway, right? And we can also take a look at our CloudWatch logs right over here. And eventually we should see a log entry in here that shows that the storage gateway received that file. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay in here as well, but let's go ahead and open up the S3 service right over here. And we're going to look for the Trevor Stratus Grid storage gateway bucket right here. And we'll just open that up directly in the AWS Management Console. Again, you can use whatever kind of tool you want, whether it's a command line tool or a graphical tool like Cyberduck, for example, or any other S3 compatible tool. But as you can see, we have a file that's 18 bytes in size called test.txt right here. So as soon as the storage gateway flushes its cache to the S3 bucket from its local cache volume, that 150 gig volume that we have, you'll see that file show up eventually in S3 storage. So if we just replicate that again, let's just do touch test2.txt, and then we'll say move test2.txt to the same mount location right there. If I come back to S3 instantly and refresh right here, you can see that it, that file does not instantaneously show up. But because I was talking for a few seconds before we actually came over to S3, the first time that we wrote that test.txt file, you'll see that it did have enough time to show up. Now, if you ever want to, you do actually have the option to force a flush of the cache. So if you come back over to the storage gateway console and then go to file shares, open up that specific file share, and then go to actions, you can actually force the file share to refresh its cache. And that should force things to move along a little bit faster. And so after a little bit here, you should eventually see that other file show up inside of 
S3 right here, but we can actually go the other direction as well. So if we were to upload a file locally from our system, and there's that test2.txt file, it finally showed up after about maybe a minute or so. We can also upload data directly into S3 and make that data accessible from the other system as well. So what I'm gonna do is just upload a little SVG or PNG image file right here. And then I'll go ahead and upload that. It's only a 45 kilobyte file. So now that I've uploaded that file into the S3 bucket, you can see now we have three objects inside the S3 bucket here. And if I switch back over to the Linux client that's connected to the NFS storage right here, we'll just rerun the ls command right here. And eventually we should see that PNG file show up right here as well. So if we run a watch command, and that'll just refresh every couple of seconds right here. We should eventually see that PNG file show up inside of Storage Gateway here from the client's perspective. So again, I'm just going to go back to the file share right here, say actions, refresh, cache, just to force it a little bit faster there. And while that's refreshing its cache, I'm actually going to go over to CloudWatch logs right here. And you can see that we've actually got some log events available here. So under file system audit, you can see that the object test.txt was created. If we go a little bit further, we can see that test.txt was written to. If we go a little bit further, you can see it did a write attributes operation on it. And then this one is test2.txt and that one was created as well. So it just gives you kind of this audit trail of the file access on your NFS share through the storage gateway service. So let's come back over here to my terminal. And now you can see that now that I refreshed the cache on the storage gateway file share, you can see that that PNG file is now accessible from this mount point slash mount slash NFS data. So now I can just do a copy command and say copy mount NFS data, take that restation PNG file there and just copy it to my home directory. And so now if I do ls, you can see that that PNG file was copied from the storage gateway NFS file share over to the local storage of my Linux server client that I have connected to that NFS share here. So that's basically how the file gateway works in the storage gateway service. It's a really easy way to set up NFS and SMB compatible file storage for different applications that need access to network storage. And the really nice thing is that all that data is just stored in S3. So S3 is a really common storage mechanism, and it gives you a lot of options for different pricing tiers, depending on how much durability and how frequently you need to be able to access that data from S3 as well. So feel free to try this out yourself in your own AWS account. Go ahead and just create a storage gateway, create a file share using the NFS protocol right here, and then fire up a Linux server and then install the NFS common package, and you should be able to mount this file share very easily from that Linux server. So thanks for watching this video. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you learned from this video and any other topics around AWS storage that you're interested in seeing or any other AWS cloud topics. would be happy to take feedback on that as well. And I hope you learned something new. So leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks again and take care.